The other thing that's not going to come through in his, his, his bio, because he's, I think, far too modest or explains it in ways that are difficult to understand, Lee's one of the most innovative people, innovative in the sense of drawing, for me, drawing ideas from outside of our business. And he and his co-author, um, Mary Holton, have spent a lot of time, particularly south of the border, trying to communicate to people at all sorts of levels, particularly in government, senior government, what's going on in the industry regards human resources, an area that, that Lee actually worked as a, as a uh, consultant for an Australian placement firm, or he was a principal capital, capital principal or something. Um, still very interested in it. So I went to a talk earlier this week from Deloitte. They had a press release and they were talking about ecosystems. I uh, know Sean, Sean was there. I want to hear what you thought about ecosystems, but I told Steve Bussey at T, it's sort of difficult to, for a guy in a suit to tell me I should hug the guy beside me and sing Kumbaya. But, you know, <laughs> is that an ecosystem? But I mean, in a way, they are trying, uh, even if they wear suits. $2,000 suits. Uh, so anyways, Lee is, is, and Mary have put this together. It's, it's a, I guess, always a journey, a work in progress, but uh, it's, uh, understand he is a geologist, so he really understands the business, and he understands our mindsets very well, and he is trying to help us think more broadly. <coughs> and I promised that water's fresh. Ken didn't tell you that we had a adjoining offices, so I was just going by a door that opened on Friday afternoons to hear Taylor Ships and kind of collected up a lot of the, the Denver exploration community there and we basically redesigned the, the exploration business many times, both in terms of detailed technologies that were there, but also this kind of stuff here is what does it all mean, how could we do this better, what's the path forward, those kinds of things. So. What you're going to do is, is, is see the, the, that continuing process. The, uh, the, the topic here, and I was talking with Graham Klaus at the break here, is, uh, is how do we develop better technologies, but then a lot of how do we get them in place so that the end result is we've got something useful that everyone else can use. And I think there's some amazingly clever work being done, but a lot of it isn't coming out fully so that we can fully embrace it. And that's what this talk is really about, is, is to sort of challenge that idea of can't we do that better. And the idea here is uh, six faces plus time or on three planes. But really want to talk here about technology, the role of people, and the role of need, which is the driver. And of course, the faces that I've put here is Stephen Joel, but Jack Welsh, and of course, the guy with the money, I think, of course, is Robert Friedman. Uh, and then each one of those has a dimension. And so in the case of technology, basic research and delivery to market, and the characteristics of those are just very different. And when we pry them apart, we can start to think about things a little bit differently. So part of this is lump things together, part of it's take it apart, and then see where that would lead us if we go through that little experiment. In the case of execution, what I talk is there's starters and their finishers, and they're very different. And in the end, what I'm advocating, of course, is diversity. And with respect to the driver, we think of this in terms of being profit, but society is also a driver, and I want to pull that apart uh, to be able to look at that differently and the roles that it plays in the context of different kinds of innovation. So what I'm going to do is define a language around innovation, and then give a resource example so it sort of grounds us in that language define these three planes and six faces, put a mining case to it, and then take it out to the next level. What I found is that everybody puts innovation near the top of stuff that we need to do, but when you start talking about the details of innovation, it's just amazing how we don't use the same words. So we, I <coughs> what we found over many years, you'd find you'd be talking for 15 minutes using a particular word, and then all of a sudden dawns on you, we're using the word very differently. So I think in order to be able to look at things like innovation and technologies going forward, we have to ground ourselves in the language. And almost any language would do as long as we agree what the language would be. So let me talk about some language here. And of course, here up across the bottom is sort of the, the, the degree of newness of the technology or innovation. 
And by innovation, I'm talking here not just the technology parts, but new business processes. And an example would be, I think probably in the mining industry, the maybe the innovation of all time was Jack Link's Kennecott Bingham pit. What was the technological innovation? He didn't invent a railroad or a steam engine. It was a business process and putting those things together. And it absolutely revolutionized the mining industry. So, so it's that broad thing of just simply doing things better. So across the bottom, from low to medium to high, is degree of newness. And across the vertical axis, there is degree of added value. And technologies can fall into different spectrums of that. Uh, and in the end, you call that incremental, or substantial, or radical, or transform transformative. And as an example, I would suggest incremental innovation in mining would be bigger trucks. Uh, substantial would be autonomous trucks. And of course, if you're going to do radical, you take trucks completely out of the equation, but you end up with the metal. So it's that kind of definition that when we start talking about innovation, and, and then when we try to figure out how to go forward with it, how do we pry those things apart? And what might we learn when we do that? This is another <coughs> diagram on innovation. And across the bottom is what customers want or what they believe. And the vertical axis is the amount of customers that are players in that. Now, those of you that have been involved in change management realize this is actually the change management curve. So there's early adopters, and there's those that don't adopt and just simply die because they didn't do it. So you could put words over the top of that. At the front end of this process are the innovators and technological enthusiasts, and then there's sort of a process going forward. And we basically, from the innovation side, we're pushing into that market because we're the champions of that. And there aren't really customers except for the zealots that really want to see this stuff. And at some point in time, we tag something that's relevant and we start having the customers pull us forward. So what they have is that there's a pull and a push and you have to get across that valley. <laughs> and it's a completely different mindset to go across the valley. And how money moves through that and how work products move through that also can be very different. So again, it's a language. Another piece of the same kind of language, and, and I really like this because it's the sort of the camel syndrome. And I put pull and push on that diagram, and I put radical and incremental across it, is basically on the, on the left-hand side, what you see there is somebody coming up with the first principles idea. And it's just an amazing idea, but so what? What can be done with it? And then you start to say, well, gee, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. Well, you're still the technological zealot. And you're trying to push that forward. And then you see that this thing might be applicable. Well, that's the radical innovation part. Now you've got to apply it to the market. So again, there's a language, and you go through this valley that you eventually go from sort of human-centered design and research at that front end to you start to do incremental uh, tinkering with this first principles innovation, and all of a sudden you're saying, you know what, I think this can add value, blah, 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 and you take that forward. And it might have value, and it might not. But until you get it all the way into the customer and it's valuable to somebody, I don't know that you've created any value. You've, we've entertained ourselves, but I'm not sure we've created any value with that particular part. So this is that language that I want to introduce. And then I would suggest, because I think we're all familiar with Pierre Lassonde's evolution of a junior company, that's what we're looking at. But you're looking at the junior company coming up with a prospect. There's a lot of promotion around that. People are excited because it could be anything. And at some point in time, reality sets in on that first little peak on the, the camel part. And then it starts to have engineering and pre-feasibility studies, and you go into the valley of death. And you've got this speculator group of people that say, well, gee, the most likely news I'm going to hear is bad news, so I'm out of this thing. And then the investors, the, the people that want to see a mine go forward, are saying, I think there's a little bit too much risk there. So you're not able to go forward. And of course, Lasan has described that wonderfully. And all of us with junior companies have lived through that valley of death, or died in that valley of death, or are struggling currently in that valley of death. Um, that is also the innovation curve. And you can actually use that same sequence through that. So again, there's a diversity of thought, diversity of customers. So 
So let me give you a, a resource example. And obviously, I'm going to use one here that's, that's geology and geophysics. I put the two together. Because actually, getting out of school, I started as a geologist, and I worked my career as a geophysicist. So they never asked me what I graduated in, so I ended up as chief geophysicist. But thank God nobody actually wanted to see my degree through the process. That was Placer Dome, by the way. So let me talk about something that, that no one, I think, will debate whether or not there was a radical innovation. And it's somewhere around the word 3D seismic. Now, we, we know it was radical because there's a period of time when there was a discovery cost for oil, and there was a later period of time, then that was before 3D seismic, and there's a later period of time after 3D seismic, and that cost is a third or a half of what it was before. So something happened in between it, and we generally, when we say, gosh, why can't we have a 3D seismic in the mining industry, we use that. And what I'd suggest is that I'm not entirely sure what that was. I'll, I'll tell you what I think it was. So we use this concept of an innovation and just as a euphemism as to what really happened. And I want to pry that apart, again, put it in the context of the language. So here's the driver. And what you're seeing here is oil price for 150 years. And I think we're probably all familiar with this diagram and it's inflation adjusted and then, then in real dollars. And, and what you're seeing there is in the face of increasing demand, absolutely exponential increase in demand. You're seeing the price drop, 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 drop. Now it's hard to say that we're not innovating somehow because how are we producing at lower and lower costs and the larger and larger demands? So there's innovation in there somewhere, but we don't necessarily talk about what that is. Obviously it's incremental innovation. And then we get an event, 1972 is the beginning of it, 1974 is the event and you see a step change in oil price. So that's a stimulus in the context of natural resources, and I'd say that stimulus starts in motion things that relate to innovation, because now we have a problem. And that's a societal problem, because we're not getting the oil we needed, there's a shortage of demand, what are the implications of that, and what happened? And I want to take that apart. And if that's not the ugliest slide you're going to see, it certainly is in the running. But I couldn't figure out how else to convey this particular point. And the details aren't as important. But across the bottom is, what is that, 45 years. And what I'm doing is showing that 1974 event on the left-hand side. And then I'm watching five different innovations occur sequentially. And this is largely drawn from a really interesting article in The Atlantic from 2001 by Jonathan Rouse, who's the science writer for The Atlantic. And he was, the title of this particular paper is called uh, New Old World Economy. And what he was saying is that the value of the new economy doesn't really create value, it just allows you to shuffle stuff around. And when it creates value is when it gets applied to the old economy. So he used oil as an example. So what I've done then is from that article and from other things, put on things that relate to this eventual, as I show at the bottom, a discovery cost that was $12 to $16 a barrel, and sometime later it was $4 to $8 a barrel. So what happened? And what you're seeing there first is the birth of 3D seismic as a science was in 1975. So the, the concept itself was there, but it was hopelessly uneconomic. And then, and I thought this happened earlier, but very well recognized, the birth of sequence stratigraphy. So of course what, I may be a little older than some of the other people in the room, but, but basically what you thought in terms of stratigraphy with respect to time is the sandstones were sandstones and the, the shales were shales and that was a moment in time. And of course sequence stratigraphy using say a beach environment with, with carbonate reefs and they grow out, what you realize is you cut through time. Oh my God, that is interesting. Now what do you do with it is another thing. Well, it turns out you can map that with 3D seismic. So that's what you see emerging in about 1986. Now the topic is, so what? Because now you have to hit the target. So you can do very clever mapping of the target, but if you can't drill the drill hole to hit the target, it's got no value. 
So now the, the cost, and I've got the cost of 3D seismic processing across the top, it was originally $8 million in, uh, what, what's that, about 1977 for a square kilometer, and then it dropped to a million, and then it's $90,000 per square kilometer. So now we can really see these targets, but unless you can do angle drills and steer the drill bit, it doesn't make any difference whether you can see or not. So what you have when you sequence these all the way through is at first we were doing horizontal wells, but they weren't cost competitive. Then we improved those techniques, then they're cost competitive. And by 1996, 80% of the wells in the, in the Gulf are using 3D seismic. Then we end up with horizontal fracking. Now, I don't know what all of our neighbors probably think fracking got invented in just the last five or six years, but I think we got 45 years of fracking here. The idea of doing it horizontally is simply because we didn't have a horizontal well, so we didn't horizontal frack. Because we just did vertical fracking in, in the zones. But now we've got horizontal fracking. Now we really have something that transformation. So what was the technology? <coughs> and it's a whole sequence of those multiple disciplines going forward. Now how did we move forward so fast with the reserve? Well, we're drilling vertical holes all over the U.S. in these reservoirs, so it's no magic that we have resources. They're only reserves if they're economic. So once you have a reserve base like that, that's not economic because you don't have the recovery methods, you've really loaded the gun. The moment you have the ability to recover things with horizontal holes and fracking that you didn't before, that you can now hit, you revolutionize the oil and gas business. And we discovered things that we'd actually known probably for 75 years. Discovered them in the sense of being an economic resource. Very cheap exploration. So what we looked at was a, a stimulus in 1974. That had nothing to do with technology. That was a social stimulus. That was not getting along with people in the Middle East. And what it did was cross off the list a whole bunch of reserves that were already in the equation when we were counting on them to happen. So when you cross out so many reserves, you get a step price and change, and it doesn't go away very fast. So we had that stimulus resulted in a tenfold increase in the price of oil. So we now have a, 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 an economic opportunity to be able to go forward to finance the incentive for innovation. And then we had five innovations over the next 30 years. 3D seismic, sequence to pop, to stratigraphy, efficient computing, directional drilling, and fracking applied to horizontal holes. The result, 25 years later, we cut the discovery cost in half. 40 years later, we trashed the price because we oversupplied the market. Any surprises? <coughs> That's the sequence of innovation coming into the market and the consequences of doing it very well. That's radical. The incremental version is what we did for nearly 100 years in the oil price of incrementally improving that with other kinds of innovation. And the issue is, what were those innovations? And we can learn by those and then try to go forward with that. Now, what I want to do is plot that back on radical versus uh, incremental. And I can't argue that any of those five were actually radical. And things like horizontal fracking, I mean, give me a break, we already did fracking a lot. We just didn't do it horizontally. So it added a lot of value, but it wasn't new. And something like sequence stratigraphy was very new, but it didn't add any value until you could do something with it. But collectively, they're absolutely radical. So that tells us that what we want to be able to do to be able to go forward is diversity, multidisciplinary, and combining those things. So that builds this foundation for dividing the three planes and six faces. So what I'm trying to do here is in execution, I'm going to talk about people as starters and finishers. Another plane in technology is basic research and delivery to the market. And the driver is profit. It's always easy to picture Robert Friedman with a $100 bill, because it sort of is all of our people's vision there. And society is a driver. The society driver would be like the Middle East issue. And of course, what I'm going to do is each color represents each face. 
and I'm talking about the Rubik's Cube, of course. So just for the math, because I think there's probably a lot of us that like the math part of this, who have never solved that Rubik's Cube. My kids can do it, I can't do it. There's 43 quadrillion possible solutions to that. So if you did one per second, it would take the lifespan of the Earth times 3,000 to randomly get that. So, and it's just a small number of colors on a bunch of faces, but you have to solve all three faces at the same, all six faces, all three dimensions at the same time to come up with the solution. Now it took the Google Computer Bank to calculate that you can always solve that within 20 moves, if you know what you're doing. I'm not suggesting innovation is that easy. But I'm just saying the concept is simple, and the realization of it takes a lot of complexity to do that. So I want to talk then about each of those planes, and I'm going to use the language that we defined here before. So I've got the normal curve across the top, I've got the camel pump thing, which is below that, I'm going to talk about technology. So in basic research, which is the front end of that, it's the discovery or the adaptation of things that are already known to something that they hadn't been applied at. And that is a very specific approach. It developed new technologies with first principles in science or uniquely adapting technologies or methods from other disciplines. That is where most of the stuff is done. That's what the national labs do. And nothing comes of it. Because it's wonderful work and so what? So actually, Harry, you had that job for a while. Exactly that. Try to get this incredible first principles work out into the normal use of things. And then you bring it to market. That's refined, optimized technologies, methods, costs, delivery to markets. So that is a matter It's all incremental based on that idea. And if you don't have the two, you've created nothing except entertain ourselves and spend money. The people part, which is what I spent a lot of my last career as, kind of one of my favorite parts. So at the front end of that, starters, and this is actually a specific personality type that's been covered in a wonderful paper. Um, innovative, radical innovation people, is when they make a mistake in their experiment, say it's the right answer, I've asked the wrong question. Now if you're doing radical innovation and you're designing the experiment, experiments, by definition, you're wrong most of the time. Otherwise, it wouldn't be radical. So there's a personality type, like many of us could do, could design the experiment, and many of us failing in the experiment would say, damn it, that was a waste of money, I should have done that differently. And somebody else said, I know I designed that experiment correctly, that told me something I didn't know, can I do something with that other thing? Now that's a specific personality type. There's another personality type, which are the finishers, that are efficient, practical, and they commercialize. And I'd suggest if you don't have those two personality types, and they seldom exist in the same person, you probably can't have innovation. Now the fun part is they come with a whole family of other things. So starters are creative, unconventional, undisciplined, they break rules, they're idea, fo idea focused, not afraid to make mistakes, they're nonlinear. So one plus one could be five, I mean, what are the boundaries here? They're reluctant project managers because they're always drawn to the new adventure instead of finishing something. The offside to those people, rigorous, conventional, disciplined, make rules, process focus, they abhor mistakes. <clears throat> Linear, one plus one is equal to, I'll go one and a half, maybe some days I'll give you two. And they're good project managers. So unless you construct teams that have those two people and they trust each other, same as the same language, and unfortunately, it's usually the finishers that have to be in charge because the budget has to get done. But they have to understand that it's the other people that never turn in their budgets and they don't turn in their expense accounts and they park in the wrong parking place and they get in trouble with the vice president, that they're the ones, the high maintenance people that are creating that. You can't afford very many of those people. But you have to be able to enable them if you want to do original work. So every time we go through one of these purge cycles, of course, those are the people we let go because we can't figure out how they're already adding value and they didn't turn in their expense account. So they're hard to manage. And then the other version on this is driver's profit. So it's basically the cost side of the story. 
And it's commodity prices driven by supply and demand, of course. So there's available technologies. The incremental innovation is that we nick away at the cost because we can find increasing ways to be more efficient. So it's a cost-focused thing. The societal side of this is constant growth. Right now, it's not population. It's actually increasing affluence. So that's what the 3 billion people coming into the consumer grid are doing. It's that constant growth in demand. And it builds a foundation that is unstoppable. So it drives the, the price side of the equation. And the other component that sits inside of that society is evolving beliefs and values. So what happens in the evolving beliefs and values is as people get more affluent, NIMBY is a real thing because they're pretty comfortable. So at some point in time, they're kind of opposed to all change. So they have the ability to sterilize resources. And cultural challenges have the ability to sterilize resources. And that's what happened in 1974. A question is to whether that was a fair transaction for the amount of money. And the influence of Western culture on Middle Eastern cultures. So society drives those, and they probably affect them differently. So we'll take those apart a little bit. So talk about the mining case. Because now I've got, of course, the oil and gas case and a bunch of stuff in there. And by the way, I didn't have the conclusion I ended up with when I started. It was an experiment. So I kept calling Mary and saying, oh my god, this took me down an alley. And I'm not sure I can get out of the alley. So she talked me down from the ledge, and we go a little bit further in this. Um, this is a diagram that looks at 50 years of inflation-adjusted copper and iron price. So what those are really doing is looking at what's, why society needs mining. And what you see is the same as you saw in oil and gas, ever decreasing price until an event. And that particular event was 2007, step change in price. Now what was interesting here is when we had the step change in oil, it took 25 years to beat up the market. We beat up the market in oil and gas, in, or in, in mining, in 10 years. And trust me, it isn't just because China slowed down. I'll show, I'll show you another graph. That's, I mean, certainly that happened, but what were we thinking? They don't go forever. And they have only dropped from 10 or 12% to 6 or 8%. That's still a lot of demand when you multiply it by a billion. <coughs> so the issue there is we did something to the market in 10 years that it took the oil and gas industry 25 years ago. So is there something about mining that's different than oil and gas? Now the first thing is the 10 years. Now I haven't found anyone else that's familiar with this paper by Upstill and Hall, unless you're Australian. It, they, they did a lot of work with BHP. And they looked at innovation in the mining industry in the context of challenge, basically, this phrase that the mining industry reinvests less money into R&D than any other sector. And it's terrible. We should be doing much better. The other, and I'll go over that in a moment here. Then the other is, I would suggest, the log normal distribution of graves and deposits. And because I, 1971, I was a geophysicist, I ended up bringing the geostatistics stuff into Placer, so I did a huge number, because I was a math kind of guy, a huge amount of geostatistics stuff. So I did a lot of ore reserve stuff. And I want to go and look at those two in the context of the mining industry distinguished from other industries. First, what Hall and Upstill said, conventional thought, basic materials and metallic products, is 1997 data. There's a reinvestment of 0.7 to 0.9% of our revenues. And that's lower than pharmaceuticals and information processing. Now, what they also realized is, if that's the case, where's the innovation coming that continues to drop the price? Because it doesn't make any sense. The innovation's somewhere, and it apparently isn't coming from the research we're doing. So what they did was recalculate it to include engineering, exploration, R&D, and capital goods that relate to the mining industry. And what they found when you do that recalculation it's 2.85 to 2.89%, which is the highest, which is consistent with what the result is. So what do they actually say? And what they're saying there is 
when you're a mature industry like the mining industry, there are support industries that in themselves are big industries. So bigger trucks doesn't get reported in the R&D for BHP, it gets reported in the R&D for Caterpillar. And Caterpillar spends $2 billion a year, and the mining industry is the beneficiary of that. So we get our innovation from a parallel industry. That tells us a lot. So when you put that into the engineering design work by the Bechtels and uh, floors of the world, and you start putting those back in, that's where we're getting our innovation. And when you start doing that, you say, where's the shortage of innovation? It's hard to find the evidence for it. Because we keep crashing the price. So one of the arguments there, of course, is that we may not need radical innovation because we're so good at incremental innovation, and we're simply not recognizing it. It also suggests why where universities should be doing much more about like, disciplinary research and combining things instead of prying the things apart. Now the other in this particular thing is the tonnage grade curve for that live and good gold deposit. But you can use almost any hydrothermal deposit and, and quite a few sedimentary deposits. So what I'm pointing out here is that if you double the price, you have the cutoff grade. That's obvious. That's the break-even stuff. It's completely obvious that you do that break-even grade was $4, and all of a sudden the price is high. The $4 is the same, but it's half the grade. <coughs> so when you have the tonnage grade curve, and you drop the cutoff grade from 0.7 to 0.35, you increase the reserve, talking reserve, from a million ounces to three million ounces. So we have discovered 200% increase at no cost. So every time we get an increase in price, and it sticks around for any length of time, the ore deposits themselves create that additional ounce. At some point, you exhaust that. But right now, we've got a lot of stuff in the inventory. So little bits of change in the price is in, it's really not even incremental innovation. It's just an adjustment that creates the ounces. Now, those ounces also come in places that already have permits, already have a mill, already have infrastructure, already have power makes them more efficient, and a lot of companies simply expand the, or expand the throughput, which increases the demand higher than it should be done, or the supply, and it trashes the price. I think that's a business systems problem, probably not technology related. But that's where a lot of our innovation incentive goes to mining, is just that simple observation about the law of normal distribution of reserves that can be mined for decades. So then what we're talking about in innovation in the mining case is that incremental innovation continues to serve the mining industry. And the need driver via its higher prices is likely, unlikely to exist long enough to support the development of radical innovation because we can adjust to it so quickly. Social developments are capable of permanently sterilizing significant reserves. So if we have radical innovation, it'll be because we have sterilized reserves, which will be resource nationalism, it'll be uh, crossing enough pebbles off the list <coughs> that were in our pipeline. That's a social thing. So the examples of social things would be resource nationalism or social license, including threat of cultural globalization. So when you put it back into the graph of different kinds of innovation, what we see is at the incremental part, it's driven by demand, and it's a cost sort of thing. And when you look at radical, it's going to be delivered by changes in supply, basically crossing pieces of the supply off, and it's going to be driven by social. And I guarantee going forward, our challenge in the mining industry is going to be social. So we're going to probably need radical innovation of some sort. Because increasingly, a lot of social pressure on that. So what does it all mean? So I would suggest that one thing is in sequencing innovation. Radical innovation is usually the result of breakthroughs in first principle science, kind of, or a unique business process. Incremental follows radical. 
and it falls the first time when you commercialize it and continues to follow it until it doesn't serve the purpose anymore. So something else comes in that's radical, but that's driven by a need. Disruption of supply driven by social events can support radical innovation because it can cross off reserves that we already had in the equation. Increasing demand uh, drives incremental identification because it's steady, slow, and predictable. So you can actually put that into the plans. You have some sense of how that go. We don't hit it very well because we oversupply the market. <coughs> and the rate of change of consumption is steady. And you can count on it. You can plan to it. You can put budgets around it. And there's a history of innovation doing that for more than 100 years. And you can make any argument that we have in the mining industry, we maybe have too much innovation because we keep trashing our profession by having to lay people off because we oversupplied the market. I'm not saying that. Harry said he'd protect me if people started throwing things at me. <laughs> so here's just an interesting little example. And of course, this is out of the US energy demand. And I'm just showing the supply demand of oil. And that is five years. So what you're seeing is the unbalance there in the little green things. And what I'll show you here is I just put some lines through it. That demand curve didn't even flinch. That's just a simple straight line. So I would say that maybe we can blame it on China and unreported or something. But, well, I can't find data that indicates that. I know that's out there. But what we simply did, and I show it across the top in terms of price, there in uh, 2011, the price popped above $100. And oh my god, did people want to write us checks. And we took the checks, and we produced oil. And then in that little window, we dropped the price down to $25 or $35. Because we oversupplied. Because we had the ability to do that. We had all of that innovation in place to be able to do that. So, and I'm very near yeah. here, so. so what I'd say is social initiatives, which is decrease in supply, drive radical innovation. So the, the sequence of major social decisions can create long-lasting supply-demand imbalances that necessitate radical innovation. And then it takes a long time for those to be born. Social decisions involving beliefs and value systems then drive rules and regulations, and the rules and regulations sterilize the industry. So that is actually a social event. It just takes time to go through it. So here are those five technologies that came through, and those are the names of the sciences that they come from. So that's geophysics, geology, computer sciences, mechanical sciences, mechanical engineering, and hydrology. So geophysics is in there. And usually we think of 3D seismic as geophysics. So innovation is, starts with, and the characteristic of the innovation that's necessary dictates the kind of innovation, uh, innovation that will follow. And if it's for a long period of time, we have the ability to develop radical innovation, because it takes time. Otherwise, our ability to continue to do incremental innovation covers it, and the demand or the driver disappears. Thank you. thinking of the social removal of resources, and I, I don't know who else might have seen it, but there was a, uh, an older, I think he's a botanist, but he's published many books, and about two weeks ago, he published his, probably his last book, he's 84, but his proposal was to basically ensure biodiversity of the earth, that half the world be quarantined from people. And I don't think that's actually such a crazy idea from the point of view of what people might embrace with things like global change. A lot of places might not really be habitable for people. Uh, as of 2007, I think, or 2008, 50, over 50% of the population of the planet lives in urban areas. Yep. So, in actual fact, that's where we're going. Yeah. That's where we're going. And so, that actually, in fact, when you think about it, with a population of 9 or 10 billion people, that may be what's required for survival in the long term. 
the, the other, well, more, I would say, prosaic, that was the question. China's role is a little bit different than maybe in the, certainly the minerals game, is that they are now becoming not only a, a consumer, but they're not a passive consumer, whereas in petroleum and other minerals historically, they put them out in the open market, basically people who need it bought it. But do you think that the, the, the more uh, proactive aspects of China's going and buying companies, and whether they stockpile it or consume it, is that going to have an impact on these, on these, uh, these, these predictions? Because I don't think that event has happened before in the past. I think it's got a, another implication that is so big and we just don't have mineral economics departments that are functional mineral economists anymore. They're all policy people. They have to look at that issue. And what that issue is separate from just the China thing and you know, go and get their own reserves, because they could internalize that economy almost at any time. The rest of the world is toast. And they have a history, like four or 5,000 years, of having internalized their economy several times. So that's kind of there. Where we need the mineral economists is the idea of a sovereign wealth competing with Rio Tinto and BHP. Because sovereign wealth people create the value in the manufacturing chain. So they don't care if they report a profit in mining because it's their society that collapsed for the lack of jobs at manufacturing. So they're competing with Rio Tinto, BHP, Ballet in terms of mining companies that aren't vertically integrated and have to create their value at the mining site. That has huge implications. Because there'll be a point in time, as a sovereign wealth fund, that you would mine copper at a loss because you're making all of the profit in terms of the manufacturing in China to ship it back to the Walmart in the US. What are those implications? They are really big. And I think, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think of the 20 largest investment funds in the world, 15 are sovereign wealth funds. So what, and I do a lot of consulting for Sumitomo, which is a trading company, and I've made the argument that they look a little closer like a sovereign wealth fund, because they get their money from the government to, to find iron and copper and stuff in the manufacturing chain. So I think a lot of the future starts to look more like that in terms of going forward. Now, what's interesting about most of Sumitomo's relationships to mining is they're mostly a minority partner, and their operators are BHP, Rio Tinto, Glencore, and Valley. So those mining companies end up as a service to a sovereign wealth fund. Now, what are the implications of that? They're pretty big. And who's studying that? I don't even know where we'd study it, because we have almost no mineral economics left in the schools. It's all policy stuff. Sean, you have a comment? I don't think we've actually yeah. had a show. I don't think we've realized the implication, even us as an industry, as scientists, which we really are. About a few years ago, about two years ago in UConn, the Chinese made a <clears throat> bid for just first rights of refusal of the tungsten supply from that time in Canada. And with that, it was just 20 million bucks, just for first rights of refusal. So what happened was Japan got this group built because they realized China owns 81% of tungsten supply. And with that one move, that current, they were going to capture another 80%. Realizing that China, when we work with this, you know, we sell a copper concentrate. We hope to get a microwave. If we don't get that microwave, you know, we're kind of cutting our own supply. We haven't even thought about this. And this is, so that's what happened with the tungsten. So Japan is saying, China's never going to sell it now it's the public state. So this is today. Now you add 25 to 30 years to our to this level of the society that we just got hooked on. We've got your computers and our phones. Like we're hooked to that, like we're crazy. So we like us as a group of people, to me we have to get to the next level. And minerals are going to be like we need to survive. hundred years ago we had it with the packs. Now we need everything else. So we're going to have to get to this next level as a group, and we're all working a little bit separate as a business, but now we're starting to talk collaboration with you know, trying innovation. But I hope to see us one day all working on this. Like we're not getting
given our respect in society for who we really are. And it was, we were more proud 25 years ago, so we lost some of that pride. But this is, like, we have to realize that this is the only thing about it. And, and, and of course, the most obvious example, because tungsten's absolutely there, but rarest is the example. You don't have rarest mined in the U.S. because they're not worth anything. It's only worth something if you don't have it. Thanks, Lee.